So we're looking at Sukkot, uh, and uh, a, a sukkah is not really a tent. It's more like a wooden framework, and the Jewish people are commanded to take specifically four kinds of plants, the leaves of plants and plants, and uh, weave them in and make walls, so it's kind of like a lean-to, a wooden framework with vegetation around it and on the roof, and it's uh, very interesting. It's probably the most joyous of, of the uh, feast. Some of the, the, the festivals or feasts are not really festive at all, so we looked a little bit ago at Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and that is a day of, of remembering sin and of, of acknowledging we're sinners before a holy God, and unless God helps us, we're, we're done, we're cooked. And so that's the day when the priest goes into the, uh, the, the tabernacle of the temple and makes atonement for the sin of himself and his family and then of the nation, and there's blood. Remember that we looked at that last week. So we're looking at Sukkot uh, this morning. And it is the final feast in the annual cycle. Uh, it occurs five days after Yom Kippur, so that's September, October. Seven days of great rejoicing followed by a solemn assembly on the eighth day. So there's actually a solemn assembly on the first day. So uh, in, in the ancient days, I would have gone to the temple in modern days to go to a synagogue, and then you have seven days of rejoicing, and then on the eighth day, another solemn assembly. Uh, and it is the directions for this are found in Leviticus 23. It is the third and final feast, uh, which males were required to attend in Jerusalem. <clears throat> so the, the three uh, feasts were Passover, Unleavened Bread, and Sukkot. So there's a solemn assembly, meaning uh, a service, a, you know, today a synagogue service, and then activities at home. Uh, today, uh, Jews are encouraged to spend more time in their sukkah than in their house for those seven days. So they, they traditionally try to have all their meals uh, in the sukkah. It's usually on the back side of their house or if they have a garden, uh, they will build a, a sukkah uh, and have outdoor meals and so on. Uh, so let me read for you the, the location where this comes from, God's command to the Jews in Leviticus 23, and it's starting in verse 33 and going to the end of the chapter. So here it is, Leviticus 23, 33. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the 15th of this seventh month is the Feast of Booths for seven days to the Lord. On the first day is a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work of any kind. For seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation and present an offering by fire to the Lord. It is an assembly. You shall do no laborious work. These are the appointed times of the Lord which you shall proclaim as holy convocations to present offerings by fire to, to the Lord, burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each day's matter on its own day, Besides those of the Sabbaths of the Lord, and besides your gifts, and besides all your votive and free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. On exactly the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the crops of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord for seven days, with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. Now on the first day you shall take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall thus celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall live in booths for seven days. All the native born in Israel shall live in booths, so that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the sons of Israel the appointed times of the Lord. So there's the direction from God through Moses for uh, the, the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. And you can see what God is saying here. There were, it's not here, but I think it might be in Exodus, 
uh, the, the directions for the festivals are kind of scattered through the Torah. So that you find some over here and some here. And there were specified offerings, animal sacrifices to be made. And uh, uh, I think it was most, mostly bulls that were offered. And the total number for the entire eight days was 70. So it's a certain number on a certain day and then another number on a different day and, and, and so on. And by the time you're done, uh, 70 bulls would have been killed and offered as animal sacrifices. So uh, this is the last of the year, the, the, the Jewish calendar year, the last festival in the cycle. So there's several spring festivals and then there's kind of a break and then there's several in the fall and uh, early winter. So a sukkah is not really a tent or a tabernacle, and it's not really a booth as we think of it, more like a lean-to. And I, I should have found some pictures for you to show you. So picture a, a small, uh, you know, it's five feet wide or six feet wide by eight or nine feet long and tall enough to stand up in. And you have a table and chairs because you're gonna eat there. Uh, it might be bigger if you have more room uh, and it's a wooden, kind of a lattice structure, and you're going to collect branches of trees and plants and palm leaves, and you might even kind of weave them into the lattice. And so you can see through, but it's going to give you some shade. If you're outside and it's warm in the sunshine, the vegetation will give you some, some shade from the sun. But at night, you can actually see through the leaves and see the stars. So it's an outdoor screen room made of living vegetation. The four species that God requires in 2340 of Leviticus are the etrog. So we don't know what an etrog is here. We don't have them in the U.S. It may be one of the original citrus fruits in the world. It's, a, uh, it's about this big and it's got a tough rind on it. It's yellow and kind of tart and the, the, the rind is kind of wrinkly, uh, but it's kind of oval shaped and about like this. And so the etrog, and then also the myrtle, the willow, and the palm. The palm branch in, in Leviticus uh, is called the lulav, and that has special significance. So part of the ceremonies uh, that evolved, you know, this is, this is given in the time of Moses, Moses is about 1440 BC. So this, you know, Leviticus 23 is given by God through Moses to Israel 1440 years before the time of Christ. And from then until the time of Jesus, uh, especially in the intertestamental period, so that's the period between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. So, you know, uh, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Malachi, those books are the very end of the Old Testament. And then the New Testament kicks in, uh, Matthew and Luke and like that, f about 400 years. And what are some characteristics of Jewish life and worship in the 400 years in between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament? What are some characteristics that you can think of that would describe Jewish life and worship. They were losing their walk with God. Okay, they had lost their walk with God, and as a result of their idolatry, God had punished them with exile. They had gone to Babylon. Some of them had come back. Uh, and for much of those 400 years, there was no temple. Now, the temple did get rebuilt in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. But in the, in the time when there was no temple, how, how would they observe the feasts? Well, they couldn't, because many of the feasts revolve around the altar, the temple, the Holy of Holies, and there, there is no, you know, it doesn't exist. Uh, and so uh, there, there was no temple where the priests would get out the scrolls and read the law. There, there's no place where that happens. And so in that intertestamental period, uh, groups of Jew Jewish scholars began to teach 
people in, the, in exile. So in Babylon and different places, they began to teach, uh, here's what God has said. But in that intertestamental period is where certain things began to happen, like the Pharisees. The, the beginnings of the Pharisees is in that intertestamental period. And they began to say things like, so when God says tithe, he doesn't mean just 10% of your money. He means like 10% of your herbs. And some of it is good, and a lot of it is kind of made up. A lot of it becomes oral tradition. So all that to say, some of the festivals, some of the feasts, they do have an origin, so we're looking at one right here in Leviticus 23, but a lot of the, the, the um, ceremonies, customs, traditions that evolved are not necessarily stipulated in the Bible. So here's, here's one of the things that happened. Let's see if I've got it on another slide. No. Uh, so uh, one of the ceremonies, we'll talk more about it here momentarily, uh, the people in the temple courtyard who are participating in this very joyous celebration, in their left hand, they have the etrog, this citrus fruit. They're holding it like this. In the right hand, they have the lulav, which is the palm branch. And at certain portions of the ceremony, as the priest is doing stuff, uh, the people are actually chanting and even shouting and singing. And they're going to take that lulav, that palm branch, and shake it as a symbol of joy and expectation. So these kinds of things evolved over time, and some of them are at least uh, tangentially, not directly, but kind of sidebar mentioned in the New Testament. So we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, so what is the Feast of Sukkot for? Well, Leviticus 23 gives us three things to which Sukkot is tied. In verse 39, when you have gathered the crops. So this is a festival at the end of harvest. All the crops have been harvested for the year. Uh, this is happening in October about. And so what would we have in our country that would be an analog to a harvest festival? Thanksgiving. So it would be something like that. It's an acknowledgment that God has given all the, that we have. It's the blessing of the harvest, all of our physical provisions, the food we eat, the water we drink. And in, in the Middle East, arid as it is, water is especially significant. So they acknowledge the water that you sent from the sky, the rain that came, the early rains and the latter rains, all of that is a gift from God. And we acknowledge that we have crops to harvest and to feed our families because of God's provision. So uh, uh, we've gathered, when you've gathered the crops, secondly, you shall rejoice. So Sukkot is probably the most joyous. Other, uh, other festivals did have elements of joy, but this is one where God specifically says rejoice. And uh, you know, in, in, in typical uh, modern day Sukkot, there's parties, there's get-togethers, there's family reunions. Uh, there might be some gift-giving. There's other festivals that have gift-giving. But there's a lot of joy associated uh, with Sukkot. And then lastly, in verse 43 of Leviticus, so that your generations may know that I had, this is God talking, I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them up from, from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So it does serve a memorial or a, a memory purpose of saying uh, the ancient Jews lived in temporary quarters, tents, when they came out from Egypt. And I'm reminding you of that, that I provided for them. I brought them out of Egypt. I am the one who called them and said, you're my people. I'm your God. And so there is a, a memorial portion to Sukkot. So uh, as we have seen with all of these feasts and festivals, there is a tie-in. There, there's not just an historical element, looking back to the Passover or looking back to uh, you know, the, the, the Exodus. There is that, that. There is a memorial purpose for most or all of these. 
but there's also some connections to the future. So here is one that evolved in that intertestamental period that I was talking about a moment ago. It, it doesn't show up in Leviticus 23, but it became a major part of the Sukkot celebration when all the people, because this is one of the festivals in which people were required to come to Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem would have been filled with, with these booths. Uh, you know, every house in Jerusalem would have had its little lean-to out back. And the whole city is just full of celebration. Uh, and so as people come together to the temple for Sukkot, there is a water pouring ceremony. And this is what it looks like. In the evening, the priest, it doesn't have to be the high priest, but a priest designated, takes a golden pitcher and goes from the temple down to the Pool of Siloam. The Pool of Siloam is fed by the springs of Gihon. Goes through a tunnel and it comes out at the Pool of Siloam. And the priest goes and the people, there's crowds and crowds of people following. They're following and they're, they're chanting. They're chanting Isaiah 12, 3. We will gather water from the wells of salvation. And the water of the Pool of Siloam was traditionally used in anointing the, the kings of David's line. And the water of Siloam is, is seen as the wells of salvation. And there is, a, there is an acknowledgement in the dry Middle East that God gives water. So there is that, that God is the one who supplies water for their crops. And drought is a horrible, horrible thing because it, it results in famine. So the, the priest goes down with his golden pitcher. He dips it into the pool of Siloam. And all the people are following along, and they're singing, and they're chanting. They're also chanting uh, uh, Hosanna. That's a transliteration, which means save us now. And that comes right out of Psalm 118, verse 25. And it's a cry for God's intervention. It's a pleading for God's help, for rescue, for salvation. It means, save us now. That's what Hosanna means. And so the people are chanting, uh, we will draw water from the wells of salvation and Hosanna, while the priest walks down to the Pool of Siloam, then he walks back up with his golden pitcher to the, the temple. And then each evening, there are three super tall uh, candles, not, not candles, they're oil lamp stands in the temple courtyard. There are three of them, seven armed, and they get boys to climb ladders 75 feet in the air. Yeah, and the light from these giant lamp stands could be seen throughout the entire city of Jerusalem. Anywhere in the city you, you could see these things. <clears throat> and so the lighting of the, the lamp stands was a big part of the celebration. And then the priest takes this pitcher of water and he walks around the altar, the, the burnt offering altar, in the courtyard while all the people are still chanting uh, Isaiah 12.3 and, and Psalm 118.25. And he takes the water and he pours it out. So this is going on every single evening of, of Sukkot, of the, of the festival. The, the last day of the public ceremonies, remember the eighth day is a solemn uh, convocation, a solemn gathering, and that's, that's not festive. That's quiet, that's a, a worship service. But on the last day of the public ceremonies, the seventh day, all of this happens except the, the priest walks around the altar seven times, and then he pours it out. And that's kind of the, uh, the, uh, the climax of the whole, the whole week. And people are singing and dancing, and they're shouting, and there's, there's excitement and enthusiasm. The whole temple complex is packed with people. So, Go to John chapter 7. Look in John, the seventh chapter. <clears throat> and 
And here, the Lord Jesus, his brothers, said to him, are you going up to the feast? <clears throat> you should go up and proclaim yourself. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going up. But then uh, he does go a few days later. So after the, su the sukkahs have been built, uh, after the, the lean-tos have been constructed in the city and the fe uh, festivities are underway, he goes in the middle of the week. This is down in verse um, <clears throat> 10. <clears throat> but when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as if in secret. And he begins teaching in the temple. So people are listening to him, and there's people, there's gobs of people all over the place all week long, and he finds a spot somewhere in the temple plaza, and he begins teaching, and people are listening to him, and some are, are believing, and others are not. And then, look down in... Uh, Verse 37. <clears throat> now on the last day, the great day of the feast. So this is not the eighth day, because the eighth day is that holy convocation. This is the seventh day, when everybody is together and the priest is going to walk around the, the altar seven times. And it's called the, the great day. So this is the, the climax of the whole week, uh, the big event. The lamps have been lit, the priest has the golden pitcher, and he walks around the altar seven times while the people are chanting Isaiah 12, 3 and Psalm 118, 25. And then the priest pours the pitcher out, and here's what Jesus says, and observe in 37. Now on the last of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. So this is not quiet, he shouts. This is a, a public decree, a public announcement. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And so Jesus uses the water pouring ceremony of Sukkot to say, I am the source of life. And actually verse uh, 39 says that the, the the reference he makes to rivers of living water is actually to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to take up residence and provide life and vitality to anyone who believes in him. So go back to, uh, take a look in, uh, in Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Here's another reference to Sukkot in the New Testament. So this is where, remember, uh, they're saying Hosanna, and uh, that's a, a, a transliteration of Hebrew, uh, meaning Lord save us, or save us now. And where they get that from during the ceremony of Sukkot is Psalm 118, look at verse 25. And it says, O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. So it's a cry for God's help and deliverance and prosperity. Look at verse 26. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The entire first phrase of verse 26, that, that entire thing in English, you can... You can compress it in Hebrew to one word, Hosanna. All right. So now go to Mark, Mark chapter 11. Gospel of Mark, the 11th chapter. And look please at verse 8. And here's what it says. And many spread their coats in the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. That last notation is significant because rabbinical rules about the, the sukkah, the, the kinds of things that you were allowed to take and make your little booth out of, required leafy branches cut fresh from uh, woodlands or the open field. 
And so the, you know, Mark is making particular note, this is as if, you know, it could be related to the sukkah. It's following the rules of rabbinical uh, requirement. And then observe in verse nine, those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. There's a very strong connection to the messianic kingdom. There's a, a very powerful tie-in with David's line and with the messianic age. Even the fact that the water from the pool of Siloam was used in ceremonies to anoint kings in David's line. There, there are these connections, see? And so when the people are, are quoting from Psalm 118 and Isaiah 12, they're saying, we think the king is coming. We believe that this could be the Messiah. And in fact, they were right. <laughs> what they didn't understand was that his coming to Jerusalem on this particular day was not to set up the kingdom, it was instead to die. He's, he's, in just a couple of days, he's gonna die on the cross because sin has to be handled before the kingdom can come. Uh, but he is the king, he is the Messiah, and there is gonna be a millennial kingdom. And so the, the feast of Sukkot does in fact point in this direction. Look at one more place, go to Zechariah. Chapter 14, Zechariah. <clears throat> Zechariah is a powerful book. It actually has some very detailed prophecies about the Battle of Armageddon and other elements, but we're gonna look at just a couple of verses in Zechariah 14, last chapter. And I'm gonna look at verse 16, 14 and 16 of Zechariah. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem, that's at the Battle of Armageddon, will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the, king, the Feast of Booths. And it will be that whichever the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. If the family of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. So in the Millennial Kingdom, the Feast of Booths is actually gonna be celebrated not just by Jews, but by everybody. Uh, everybody, all the natural born individuals who live in the Millennial, millennial Kingdom are required to go. They don't have to go, but if they don't go, God says, well, then you don't get rain. So the Feast of Booths is going to make a comeback in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And it's not gonna be just for Jews, but for Gentiles too. Very, very interesting. So let's take a look at two more minor feasts. So here, <clears throat> here's the Feast of Purim, and it occurs in February, March, uh, this is not one that you can look in Leviticus, <coughs> pardon me, or Numbers or Deuteronomy and, and find, well, here's the directions that God gives for how to celebrate. It, it's not like that. This is a different one, <coughs> and it celebrates the events of the book of Esther. So uh, in Esther, the story is the Jews have been scattered, and many of them are now under the thumb and living under the, the authority of, of Persia. Persia is the world power at that time. The emperor of Persia, Persia uh, Artaxerxes, or biblically Ahasuerus, uh, has dominion. And uh, this feast commemorates the salvation of the Jewish people from the wicked scheme of Haman, who was advisor to the emperor of Persia, Artaxerxes, and the dates are, he ruled from 486 to 464 BC. So you remember that story, that wicked Haman uh, wanted to kill, he wanted to commit genocide. Uh, you know, we, that, that word is still around today, uh, sadly. Uh, and so uh, he wanted to kill off all the Jews. He had a, a deep hatred 
of uh, the Jewish people, and he wanted to kill them all off. Thank you. And so he, he came up with a scheme. Uh, on a certain day, uh, the Jews are going to be attacked wherever they live in the Persian Empire. And everybody around them has permission to use whatever weapons, whatever manpower you want to kill the Jews. And whoever participates in this, you get the spoils. You get to keep whatever goods and money they have. Uh, kill the Jews, and furthermore, the Jews are not allowed to defend themselves. So, you know, it sounds like genocide. And Haman arrived at the date for when this would happen by casting lots. Purim means lots, essentially rolling dice. He rolled the dice, and this number came up, and he said, okay, that's the date. And then, of course, you remember what he did. He went to the king, the emperor, and said, uh, you know, the, there's, this, there's this group of people in your empire that are just a drag on society. They don't get along. They're different. Nobody likes them. And how about if we just kill them off? And the king says, yeah, sounds good to me. Uh, and so he signed the decree. Now, you tell me, what did Ahasuerus not know when he signed the decree for the killing off of the Jews. There's, that his wife was a Jew. He didn't know that. And so the book of Esther is very, very dramatic. So uh, today, modern celebrations of Purim involve the reading of the book of Esther in the synagogue. And every time the name Haman gets mentioned, Everybody in the congregation stamps their feet and says, boo. And every time Mordecai gets mentioned, people cheer and clap because he's one of the heroes, see. Uh, and Purim is very loud, noisy, uh, kind of a, a, a celebration. And um, they make three-cornered cookies, uh, the supposed shape of Haman's hat, and then they eat them. <laughs> <laughs> so this is... This is part of a celebration, and the background is mentioned, obviously, in the book of Esther. We don't find further mentions of Purim, say, in the New Testament. There's one other feast, however, that is not found in the Old Testament, but it is mentioned in the New Testament, and that's Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights, or the Feast of Dedication. It occurs in our November, December. I think we're in Hanukkah right now, maybe. Um, and it dates to 165 BC, so we can be pretty certain on the dates. A king named Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a Seleucid emperor, uh, was trying to outlaw and eradicate Judaism. He hated Jews, he hated Judaism, and he ordered a pig sacrificed on the altar, which obviously is desecrating. He took some of the blood and poured it on the scrolls of the Torah. And this so outraged the priest uh, his name was uh, Maccabees, which means hammer, uh, that he, uh, he began a revolution, the Maccabean revolt. Uh, eventually, it took time, but eventually it led to a period of liberation for the Jewish people. They actually kicked out the Seleucids, and they had freedom. Uh, but in the process of trying to restore proper temple ceremony and worship, uh, they discovered they only had enough oil to light the lamp for one day and to complete the process of ceremonial cleansing of the temple you needed eight days and they decided we're just going to light the lamp anyhow so they lit the lamp with enough oil in it for one day and according to tradition and it, it could well be true we don't we don't know if it is or not because the bible doesn't speak to it but it could well be true that God performed a miracle and that oil lamp lasted for eight days so that there was light in the temple and they could complete the purification process and begin proper temple worship uh, once again. So this, uh, this festival is mentioned uh, in the New Testament. Go to John chapter 10. It's called the, the Feast of Dedication because it involved the 
rededication of the temple, and it is also sometimes called the Festival of Lights, because as you know, uh, the Jews light a menorah successively, uh, one more lamp each night over the course of eight days. And so uh, here it is in John 10, and in verse 22, at that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. So this is the only Jewish festival that occurs in the wintertime, and it's called the Feast of Dedication. This is Hanukkah. And Jesus is in the temple in the portico of Solomon. And so uh, Jesus was there during Hanukkah, uh, and it is mentioned in the New Testament. So uh, the Jews have a lot of tradition. They have a, a lot of ceremony. Even non-observant Jews take pride in some of the, the customs and traditions and heritage that they have. They may not believe the Bible, but they, they take pride, as they should, uh, in, in their heritage. Uh, what are the Jews missing? What, what's the main thing that Jews are missing today? In Jesus. Jesus. They, they do not acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah and Savior. That's the thing that's missing. And, uh, you know, even as we pray for the war in Gaza and for Palestinians and Jews both to turn to Christ, uh, pray for Jews. Uh, uh, you know, they, they continue to be one of the only or the only people group in the history of the world that has retained their identity for thousands of years and they're harassed and killed because of it. And, and so pray that the Jewish people would recognize their greatest need is not even security. I mean, they do need security. Yeah, you can open the newspaper any day and see things are heating up. Uh, you know, on the northern border, Hezbollah is every single day sending rockets over. There were a couple of civilians killed, I think, yesterday uh, by... Uh, rocket propelled grenades out of out of Lebanon every day every day they need security but what they need more than security is to put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Messiah so pray for the Jewish people comments or questions we will close in prayer Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God that shows us uh, the, the, the feast, the sacrifice, uh, sacrifices, the festivals that you gave to your people to remember you and to commemorate your great hand of power and mercy in redeeming them. How we pray for the Jewish people and for the war uh, going on right now in Gaza for safety for IDF troops and civilians as well as for Palestinians. Uh, that are caught between a rock and a hard place. Father, we pray that you would point them to Jesus Christ, the thing that they need more than anything else. Help them, we pray, to realize that he died for their sins. And Father, we ask your blessing upon many, many in, in the Jewish nation uh, that they would realize that their, their greatest need uh, is, is a rela relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Uh, bless the morning service. We thank you for the chance to be together today. In Jesus' name, amen.